Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the Streamsy community call on June 27th. And uh, before starting the points in the uh, agenda, uh, is there anything someone would like to discuss or share? Seems like not. So the first point on the agenda is uh, discussion about the uh, additional volumes proposal, uh, which is there. And uh, Jakub and Tom had some comments there. And uh, yeah, it, there was a comment about discussing the details of the PR uh, for which CRDs it should apply and some security risks maybe. So if Casper uh, or Michael would like to go through the details of the proposals. Um, yes, hi everyone. Uh, so yeah, um, the proposal started with a specific use case uh, from our side. We would like to access the logs from the, the, the Kafka cluster. Uh, and the reason behind that is that we have a log4j set up saving audit logs in a separate files. We don't want to have that in the standard output. And we want to then securely access those audit logs and ship them somewhere safe. And we were hindered by the, the setup today with how uh, with how, how this has been designed. Um, then we looked at other operators. One of the inspirations one for, was from the open search operator, which we we're also working with and how they did it and start a proposal based on its design. We're having a lot of good discussions with you guys, the maintainers. I think that's that's really wonderful. Uh, uh, especially you, Jakob, you came in with a lot of good uh, holistic view of more cases and more things to think of. I think that's really, really good. I don't think there's any disagreements. And I think it's really good to, to, uh, to, to make this more generic. So we are taking all that feedback in. That's really good. Uh, I think there's some small details and nuances around security just to make sure we are aligned there and there are no uh, conflicts or, or different interests. Uh, so maybe that's good to talk about. And then I have a interest also to see, talk about the timeline here. Uh, let's say we take the feedback in, we do the, the PR, what kind of timeline can we expect working with you guys? We haven't done it before. So it would also be great to get some, some feedback on. And then I know, uh, Michael, you've also done a lot of great work and also looked at the implementation details. I don't know if you have anything to add to this, Michael Morris? No, no, I have nothing to add at the moment to, to what you said there, no. Yeah. Um, I think, oh, actually, um, there was yeah. um, mm -hmm. there was actually one detail that would be good to get uh, confirmation mm -hmm. on as well. Uh, it was a comment I put in the in the review there a while back, just trying to find it now, sorry. Yeah, so there was a, a recent change um, Sorry, that's, yeah, that's think, uh, checking that's for the, the JSON. Yes. Yeah, the JSON property order and the JSON include annotation. Just how we how we should solve that if we should update that recent change to only do that for streams related classes or if somebody else is somewhere already have solved that issue, then it would be good to get some direction on that. If anyone has any ideas? Yeah, that's that's the technical blogger. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. For now, mm -hmm. I don't think this validation should be applied to the third party classes used in the model. So. So if yeah, that's, that's a problem, it should be kind of fixed to ignore, for example, the IO fabricate classes or something like that. Okay, but Jakob, do, do, is it, would it be okay to do this as part of this uh, proposal? Or would you like a separate pull request because it's a more generic issue we are uh, hitting here? Um, from my perspective, I think you can do it in the PR you have, but yeah, you can open a separate PR as well as yeah, that might make the reviews easier, but then yeah, it's not easy to see that it works as it's not needed. No, exactly. The and then PR, there's so. a, a dependency uh, on the other PR. So I would prefer to keep it together, but I just wanted to hear the maintainer's point of view. Yeah. Okay. Um... So, but I guess, from, Michael, we have a plan for that, the technical blocker. Uh, we have a yep, plan there. That's so great. That's good. That's great yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So from my perspective, I think most of the command on the PR seem to be more about clarifying things. But one thing which I commented on yesterday, which I wanted to raise is, Lukash, if you can go to the actual PR, it might be easier than if you stick with the comments into the actual Yeah, I'm looking where is the, the, oh, where is the PR? You have to go to the top. Maybe it will be easier to just and do go. Ju no, just go to the top and press files changes. Yeah. So if you go to the line sixty eight. Here. Why is the different than in my PR? I guess I, it's, to, it, I guess it's not a ninety four now. Okay, so this one. So ninety eight, hundred two. So. Yeah. I was wondering why does it include the projected volumes, which seem to me like a lot of work, and I don't mm. think that there's any clear value. Yeah, uh, and I think that's that's, a, that's where that's where a lot of the security concerns come from because projected volumes include things such as downward API and so mm. on. Okay, that that's a fair point, and I think we should remove it. Uh, honestly, we looked at the open search operator which we're using and had good experience with, and then said let's try to do the same in, uh, with Kafka and see what kind of uh, discussion we are having. So it hasn't been uh, evaluated. Uh, the, so let's remove it if there's a concerns and we don't see any value for it now. Uh, so my understanding is that projected volumes allow you to mix different yes. files from different volumes into the same yeah. mount path. Yeah. And I don't think that seems relevant to any of the use cases we have for this. That's that's more than fair. So let's let I'll remove it so there's less complexity in this. I think and, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. And then what I was missing there is just using persistent volume claim as a as the volume, which seems to me like apart from using secrets or config maps or empty there, that that would be the most common way how to use some volume. So I was wondering if that should be added. Uh, yeah, I think we're using the CSI for that, but let me look into the details of it. Uh, yeah, I'll get back to so, you so, on this. So mm -hmm. my understanding is that with the CSI, you can directly mount some CSI persistent volume. Mm -hmm. But basically, if you add support there for persistent volume claim, mm -hmm. then basically the user can create the persistent volume claim themselves mm -hmm. with whatever persistent volume claim configuration there is. Mm. And then basically they just specify the persistent volume claim name in the volume mm. spec and mount the persistent volume claim. So, yeah. so that that seemed like something what would be yeah. useful. Yeah, um, I'll talk to a colleague who has more experience with this area and make him double check things, and we'll most likely move to project the volumes and get back to the other part. And I think we can do that that in this discussion uh, on 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 the the proposal. So uh, I think we can get that solved. And at yeah. least from my perspective, like the whole discussion around the security and so on, I think that comes from the projected volume. So if you remove those, then okay. yeah, maybe that, that comment can be ignored because then I guess it will be secrets you can still mount, but mm. yeah, you can to some extent do it today for the certificates and yeah, and so on. So exactly, okay. But let's let's remove that uh, complexity because I don't we don't see any specific need for projected volumes either, and it's causing a lot of concern. So, so let's keep it simple. Good Great. feedback. Thanks. Um, do you have any concerns or issues, Michael, you've also been 
participating in this. No, no, that's fine to me. We can move the projected volume. So it's not a concern for me. Yeah. Well, uh, Maggie, what is uh, what is the use case for you uh, participating in this? By the way, um, similar similar to selves, uh, um, to, to the log files and so on to be able to um, mount those. Good. Okay, good to know. Yes. Okay, so we'll take that feedback in, we'll re reduce the, the complexity of this, uh, uh, and we will clarify with more use cases. Uh, we are pretty far ahead on the, the implementation for the PR for review. Uh, can you give us any sense of, of, of timeline? Uh, because I don't have any historic knowledge about this, uh, how how much it usually takes. We make the, we do this these changes, we make the PR ready, what, what is the usually expected time um, to get it merged and then also released? What what can be realistic here? Maybe before we get to the timeline, Tom Bentley, yes. do, do we want to discuss the the mount path to clarify it since we are all on the call? Uh, can do. I mean, um, I saw that you, um, you sort of... Uh, you were happy now with just limiting things to slash mount there. So um, if, you know, that's acceptable to Casper and Michael and, you know, nobody else has an objection, then I'd suggest that that's what we do. What do you think, Michael? Do you see any concerns here? Um, I, I would rather not place restriction in that doesn't, really need to be there. I think we're restricting people's options unnecessarily. Um, you know, and, and it's not unusual for people who want to have a consistency how to handle things across across applications. Um, I think in place and restriction like this can 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 make things work for people. Um for sure. And I think I think it was Jacob's comment that that, that we should just check certain paths that, that streams is using and, and prevent those but other than that. Um, I mm -hmm. think it'd be good to 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 allow people flex as much flexibility uh, as possible. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I agree, and I think it's uh, that's what we usually see in other operators that this is allowed, and I also think it's fair to have a a blacklist. I would also prefer that, but I don't have strong opinions. So if it's a blogger and uh, you guys are more comfortable using mount for now and then maybe open later, that's not a blogger for us. But but I would prefer the other approach. Um, So how do you move, move forward well, here? <laughs> if if we're going to go for a deny list, then what are we saying exactly is going to be on the deny list? I would say um, the the ones already being specified, like the tent deer, which is also already being managed. Uh, so those, I think that's three or four paths today. Uh, and we will make sure those cannot be overlapping. I think also the operator will or Kubernetes right back to say no, but I haven't verified it, that you can't mount the same path twice. Um, uh, can you think of other cases, Michael? And to, to add to the deny list, um, not off the top of my head, but I guess we could look through and see what's what's yeah. being used at the moment and, uh, and come up with a list. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it basically just needs to be in the proposal so that we've got a record of, of what sort of it's reserved for Strims' use so that in future we can refer back to it and think, okay, yeah. well, you know, we're safe to do things in this directory, but we're not safe to do some things in that directory. That, that's all I really want in the proposal is it's got to be clear, well, you know, for yeah, future yeah. reference. Yeah. Re really from the point of view of being safe to use it, I would, I would, that, I would say that onus is on, on, on the person using this functionality to ensure that they don't overlap with something on Strimzy rather than it being a case of Strimzy code being be, being limited. Um, but I think the, the problem is is it's it's about um, evolution, right? Because in yeah. the future, you know, we might want to do something. And if if we don't know that people haven't mounted stuff there, then we can't do it. So and um, those well, people can't reason about what the project might want to do in the future to know that they shouldn't be mounting stuff there. Do you see what I mean? It just needs to be defined. Um, yeah. 
Well, I mean, I would say I would I would say that the opposite way around. I would say that people should be free to use this and mount mount stuff where they want, but they need to be aware that in the future streams you may use a directory that that conflicts with what they're using, and then they would have an impact to update their 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 their, their mounts. Uh, but this but from that okay point of view, that's that's Strimzy, um breaking compatibility. Yeah, exactly. Which we try to avoid doing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, I guess it depends depends on, on on your definition of compatibility. I mean, you can mount the volume to to any pod, um, and usually there isn't a restriction on where you on on, on where you can mount it. Two, um, it's really basically the user who's creating that to to ensure that they're not that they're not conflicting with anything. Um, there's very few, I, I, there's not very many applications that I can think out there that would say um, that we won't use specific volumes into the future just in case you might want to mount something there. I mean, there is the point of view that the user has taken an explicit point of taking the default setup for you guys and then actively added more mappings. And then they are taking responsibility, right? Because they're doing mappings. Yep. That could be one yep. uh, viewpoint. Um, but again, uh, I personally don't have a strong opinion. I, I can align with the, the maintainer's uh, uh, concerns. Um, it's not a blocker for us. Um, but I do see the, the arguments uh, presented by Michael. But how do we move forward from this discussion? Um, I mean, I'm interested to hear, you know, if there's any other people, I'm quite happy to, if, you know, I'm a lone voice in this, then I don't want to, you know, block progress, but, you know, I do feel it's important um, that the project's able to make changes in the future. Mm. Um, you know, within the container file system in the confidence that we're not going to break things because people have, you know, mounted their own volumes there. Mm. You are not alone, Tom. But if I'm the only person that's got that concern, then... Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, okay. No, because I, I was uh, noticing that Tom was talking over me. Tom, sorry. <laughs> No, I was saying you are not alone. So I think that uh, having the slash mount as the mounting point for the user volume is the best solution. Because I can imagine that people is going to use some other places on file system and then we need that places or that directory and then we are going to break or they don't want to upgrade streams to the newer version because it's problematic for them. Okay, so to try to maybe cut it short, it looks like there are at least two maintainers who think it should be limited to slash mount. Okay. And you need the approvals for the proposal, right? So I guess it should be incorporated into the proposal. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I, I was just putting forward my, my, my own personal opinion, obviously, it's up to the, to the maintainers. Um, yeah. I would say we have kind of rolled back from a blacklist to just slash mount now. If, um, if we could go to the halfway house of, of a blacklist, then then I'd be happy. Yeah. So before we get into the timeline stuff, does anyone have anything else what they want to discuss now about the actual content? If not, then as for the timeline, so I guess you should go through the through the PR and through the comments. I left there a bunch of more points 
around things which should be kind of added to the text and so on. We mm -hmm. just discussed the supported volume type. So that's another thing and the, and the slash mount path. So I think if you update those comments and incorporate it, it mm -hmm. might be fairly fast, like taking few days for the reviews and for the, for the voting. Mm -hmm. And then it hopefully should get approved. So I don't know if you manage to incorporate the comments today or tomorrow, then yeah, maybe next week it can be approved and then we can start reviewing the PR and get that merged and mm -hmm. complete. And then from merge to release, what is the usual uh, interval for making new releases for the stuff like this? So, so that depends a bit on how it fits. Uh, so I we try to do release around every month and a half, two months. Uh, it's often based on the Kafka releases. Mm. Uh, I guess we didn't yet talk about the next release, uh, whether to do it after Kafka 3.7.1 is released uh, or uh, whether to wait for Kafka 3.8, but Kafka 3.8 doesn't seem to be moving forward. So yeah, I guess we need to talk about it. But if you want it as soon as possible, we can kind of try to somehow synchronize it into the release process so that it's not merged right after some release and so on. OK. Um... So to put words in your mouth, and I know you're not committing to anything. Uh, you guys are not committing to anything. Uh, optimistic in a few months. Uh, pessimistic, it could be later this year. Is is that fair? Having it released? No, I think a few months is the pessimistic one. Okay. Okay. The, That's good to hear. The optimistic one would be, I don't know, uh, July, I guess. The Okay. The, assuming the PR goes okay and so on, I guess the worst case would be something like September. Okay. Thanks for, for sharing your, your, um, your thoughts on this. Okay. So... Thanks, thanks for the proposal. Yeah, thanks very much for the proposal and for the discussion. Is there anything else you would like to add to this or we can proceed with another point? Uh, no, I'm, I'm very satisfied. How about you, Michael? Yeah, no, it's, uh, that's good. Thank, thanks everybody for the feedback. Yeah, happy. Okay, thanks. And yeah, moving on to the other point which is a discussion around the service account authentication. Uh, there are now two PRs. This one is the original one, which Marco edited, and it's uh, yeah, it's creating a new type uh, service account alt that extends alt. And then there were some discussions around the, uh, yeah, the process and how it should be implemented. And Marco created uh, another one, which uh, if I understood it correctly, is uh, somehow inter incorporated into the old uh, type. So as uh, Jakub mentioned in the comment, I think we should uh, discuss uh, what will be the best, uh, yeah, the best way how to implement it or if it selects the proposal. So yeah, I could mention that uh, having a new type would uh, need more tests and uh, they will be dis uh, duplicated. So what, what are the, or what do you think about uh, the procedure one or two, or is there something else uh, we can do to implement this yeah maybe i can maybe i can create a quick summary uh, uh one more time yes. basically there were uh, three things pointed out one was this duplication of the api um 
which just bloats everything and and it didn't seem like like too much too much blow too much everything for what we want to achieve here right and then uh, in fact it could be achieved with a simple flag on the existing OAuth type which is then based on the value there are some auto configurations done based on it so this uh, implementation the second one um is actually a more sensible one right uh, this is to address this issue around API duplication. And then another issue was um, the basically the validate methods of the API objects needed to be called in order to do this enhancement. And uh, this made the objects mutable, whereas I mean, by default, there there are in in terms of API, these objects are all mutable. But maybe um, once you get this from somewhere, wherever this is, it could be part of um, just this resync um, process from the server. Uh, you probably don't want the side effect invocations that suddenly change things, right? So. For the purpose of that, and still to support the this auto configuration approach, um, I changed implementation so that I basically clone these objects before I enhance them. So there is zero chance of it impacting any kind of original object that was there. And basically the usage is quite internal to the validation calls or at the very end where we construct the parameters that are then passed to the Kafka broker or the individual clients. So then there should be no side effects on these current instances and their values. Um, and there was another issue. The third one was around the fully qualified domain name, where to go to the Kubernetes API server. Um, like this can be configured to not be local cluster, um, but something else. And um, I also implemented uh, this proposed solution around that one. So this, uh, the second implementation is definitely the one to discuss, I think. That's it for me for now. <laughs> Maybe I would like to approach it from a different side. I think we have like four different options, at least four different options how to implement this. The first one, which is probably most simple, is that we do everything in documentation only. That we basically tell the user in the documentation how to configure the OAuth authentication in order to use the service account. So we tell them like, you use the type OAuth, you specify the uh, whatever OAuth server address to this and so on and so on, right? That's the, that's one side where you basically don't need to change the API. You only add the new fields, which are added like the beer token location and so on but you do not need to create any new types you do not need to create any special field then i guess the other type was what you did in the first pr where you pretty much create a new type for the authentication which duplicates all the options from the type oau but you actually use their different default values but the users can still go and customize the values if needed. And then in the second PR, you keep the OAuth type, but you add a flag that you want to use it with the service account, which triggers some auto configuration, right? And then I guess, so the option which I was kind of wondering about on the beginning 
was something slightly different that we add a new type for the authentication, but we don't do any new options. We don't copy all the options from the OAuth type. So you would have simply a type service account OAuth and that would be it. It would not have all the different OAuth options which the OAuth type has. And if the user isn't fine with the default OAuth address and so on, then they can always use the type OAuth and configure everything manually. And I wonder if that's the point where it kind of gives us a nice user experience where most users will be able to easily configure it without necessarily mirroring all the APIs and having to test what happens if the user configures in the API these five different fields together and so on. So yeah, like that is, I guess, something to consider as well. Sorry, Jakub, uh, if I got it right, and maybe a question for Marco, because I uh, didn't come to this um, yeah, PRC yet, but I was looking uh, at them right now. Um, so taking out the one, uh, so the first one, where we are kind of yeah, duplicating all the configuration, etc. So the, the two other options that we have are uh, the one from Marco, so using the same type out plus one flag, right one field uh, that yeah enables the service account out and compared to your proposal is just having uh, a new type without this flag that would be just the difference and using uh, all the kind of defaults i guess because when you are using some kubernetes service account out i guess uh, it's everything written in the stone right yeah, so so that was kind of the idea that you would have the new type, but and basically if the type is used, then the operator would automatically auto configure mm -hmm. everything to the right values. And if the auto configured values don't fit, then the user can always go back to the type of and configure everything there by hand, basically. Yeah, which is really kind of similar compared to the having a new type or the same type plus a flag where you can remove the flag and then configuring everything uh, on your own if you need some changes. Uh, so why, why do you think that having a new type is better than using the same type plus just a flag because of the additional flag? Or? Doesn't it create a cleaner API? at least from the user perspective? So I don't know, from my perspective, I, I see them, so I, I don't have a strong opinion because I, I see them uh, quite similar. So for this reason, I was trying to understand what was your point about that yeah, having a new type is better than using an existing one, but having a flag to switch. I mean, one so issue, if, if I just may, um, it is not quite obvious to me that whatever the defaults that we put in there are exactly the set of values that all the users will be satisfied. Maybe users are very used to setting, for example, the reauthentication time uh, to certain value. And so if we just hard code it to 3600, right, then uh, maybe 80% of the users will not actually be satisfied with that and will be forced to not use the default and then will, you know, will fall over to using OAuth, the regular OAuth with specifically configured everything. I mean, that's fine. You can cherry pick the values which you think should be configurable into the type service account OAuth, right? So if you think that the re-authentication re interval is something what many users might want to change, we can have it there. But I guess from user experience, the, the main improvement there would be that they would not need to specify the 
the issuer URL or the JVKS endpoint URL or whatever are the things which need to be specified there, right? So those would be those which would be kind of hard coded and which the operator would set. But yeah, if you think that the re-authentication interval should be configurable, then yeah, we can keep that as a user configurable. That should not be a problem, I think. Yeah, to me, the biggest concern or, you know, the unknown is that I will pick some set of values, but I really have zero ideas how out in the field or due to some kind of uh, security policies, people specifically override things so that they're fit, so that they fit their environment. It may not be just these attributes, it may be other stuff. Right, so like, if the question is that we don't know if the default really work for everyone, then I have to wonder whether the documentation approach is the best one then for the time being, because that way kind of everyone can customize everything and we don't need to introduce the defaults and we limit kind of the amount of changes we have in the operator. I guess we'd at least want some system testing to back up that the documentation was actually correct or documenting something that actually works. Yeah, but it's easier to add a system test than to have something sure, in sure. code and in the API, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And obviously, it's similar to the mount path, right? Like, if you leave it just to the documentation today, then yeah, judging on the popularity and what the user settings might really be, we can add the API later at any time. It's easier to add the API for that than to remove it because it doesn't work. Yeah, we can judge based on users trying to configure it and getting stuck as to how problematic it really is. I mean, uh, do you find the current implementation kind of burdensome for the user to use? It's just an additional attribute that can be true or false. And it, I mean, it is, it avoids having to um, uh, copy paste or typing out things where you can make a typo or something. But it is less explicit, right? On, on, the first um, note, I, I agree with that. The user now has to read somewhere what these values are set to. So I don't know, I think implementing instead of the flag, the new type without all the different options seems to create better UX user experience. But then you say that we might not know what the right values will be. But if we don't know what the right values will be, that applies for the Boolean flag in the current type authentication field as well, right? Yeah, that is true. That is true. Okay, so are we proceeding with the documentation part and adding the system test? And in case that uh, users will be interested in having it as API, we will create a proposal for that, maybe? 
I mean, I guess the question is, does it bring enough value to actually do anything with API versus simply documenting it? I'm inclined towards just documenting it for now until we find out that people really struggle with setting it up. At which point, you know, we might by then have a better feeling for what the defaults ought to be, for example. Yeah, I will agree with that. Yep. I've got one comment. Um, I'm not very close to this, so I, I may be I may be off, but I wonder does Strimsy OAuth support the discovery URL for the metadata you can get from an open ID endpoint? And if the answer to that is no, I want what I'm hearing here is you want an easy way to configure it against Kubernetes. So if oh well, if um, Strimsy OAuth was to support that option, would that be would that be a, a way of simplifying a configuration that would work for both Kubernetes and other OI, uh, OIDC providers? Well, these auto configure points endpoints just uh, give you the URLs for specific endpoints, but they don't tell you any details like how you're supposed to authenticate there. Um, for example, the Kubernetes API or uh, OIDC server specifically requires authentication using bearer token, which is uh, a constraint not usually present uh, on authorization servers out of the box, right? Usually you can authenticate as client ID and secret. Um, what I mean is, is the broker to access the server side endpoints um, has to authenticate and there are two, two methods basically. Either you use this client ID plus secret or you use a bearer token. And uh, actually I added this bearer token option simply in order to make this work. And it is now also available as a general option on the OAuth mechanism. So this discovery um, endpoints don't really help you much Okay. And also, they are slightly differently implemented oftentimes on different authorization servers. Okay, Bye. thanks, Marco. So we are including on uh, writing the documentation and testing it in the system tests, right? For now, I guess I would also add an example for that to the examples. Marco, does that sound reasonable to you to start with basically documenting it only? Yes, it's perfectly reasonable, definitely. I mean, of course it's fine to do the changes to add the access token location and the and the other fields uh, which are needed for the configuration and the server beer token location and so on like it doesn't mean that there have to be no api changes like you have to add these fields obviously yeah i actually have another uh, pr here ready to integrate these extra things implemented in uh, oauth library 015 this one is still open or in draft mode. And I, I, I thought that actually this current uh, PR that we're looking at, um, that this feature would get merged quicker. So I actually based the other configuration integration PR, I based on this one, uh, but actually now I'll do it the other way around. So. The, these, these things um, that are not specifically the token authentication, but are like enabling mechanisms and configurations. Um, I'll put all this in another PR and then 
I'll rebase this one on top of that one. We can merge the other one and we'll see with this one if it becomes um, implementation-wise interesting at some point. The other PR that I'm talking about was uh, the third from the bottom. Yeah, oh. it's a 9170. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Marco. Yeah, thanks. Is there anything else to this? Not for me. I guess the lesson learned is that next time we should realize early that we need really a proposal. <laughs> Okay, so moving to the next point, which is the PRs and issues. I added two here. Uh, the first one is uh, there for a long time. It's the server-side apply. I think we should maybe uh, ping the contributor if he's still interested in working on this, because there are a lot of conflicts and also some comments that needs to be resolved. So yeah, it should be ping the user. I think it's the Christian because they were uh, yeah, moving the PR between each other. Yeah, I think it's been quite a few weeks since um, there's been any activity there. So just polling them to see, you know, if they're able to carry on with it or quite what is happening with it on their side. Seems reasonable. So something like this. Yeah, I will just say triaged instead of discussed. It's the usual way. Okay. So the next one uh, is PR from Paulo, uh, which is about renaming the reason tag to the error stack, error reason tag. And uh, I saw that Jakub had some comments and Paul as well, that it can be a uh, breaking change for some of the users. So how should yeah, we no, proceed? My, my, yeah, my reason was that, uh, yeah, I can understand that the reason tag or the reason name for the tag was used uh, trying to have a kind of matching with what we have in Kubernetes, where you have conditions, but usually in a condition, you also have a type and uh, the state, something like that. So the reason is kind of more uh, understandable. Uh, so adding more information, uh, I was trying to, to, yeah, from the user's perspective, you, you get the metric and you have the fields of kind, the name and namespace, and then reason. So I was not sure how the user can understand the reason for what. So error reason, uh, yeah, allows you to understand that that's the reason because there is an error. Uh, of course, it's a breaking change. I don't know how much we are going to break uh, users. So yeah, Jakub uh, will be to to take uh, this as a reason, uh, I guess, yeah, more or less Paul. Uh, I haven't got any other maintainers to, to chime into this. To so be I honest, I, I don't follow it, Paolo. Like, you have there some state, and then you have some reason field. And it's quite clear to me that the reason field is Where is the is, state? Is the... Sorry, where is the state, Yago? It's kind, the name and namespace are the tags. The value describes the state. The value is just one zero, things like that. 
Yeah, no. whether it's ready or not ready. I don't remember, yeah, but uh, it was, uh, yeah, there is not the name of the metric here. There was one metric uh, that didn't, didn't mean to be, uh, I don't remember which metric I was referring to now. Because it it's was called, state. it's called resource state. It describes the state of the custom resource. It is zero for error and one for ready. So I think the reason is pretty readable because you have a metric describing the state and you have a reason for the state. And if it is set to nothing, then yeah, obviously there's no specific reason for the state. And if it's set to something, then that's the reason for the state. Does error reason make it any more descriptive? Why do you have a tag called error reason when the state says there is no error? I think you can make the same argument for why error reason is wrong. So I would kind of stick with the current state, which yeah, at least doesn't break it for anyone. Yeah, maybe I didn't realize that it was about the state. For this reason, I, I, I didn't remember the metric. Okay, I guess that we can close it then, if the others agree. Yeah, I don't think it's worth breaking compatibility for. So something like this. Can you scroll a little bit? Or it's me, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, I added one proposal here, uh, which is again there for for a while, and uh, there were some comments, but it seems it's a month from the last activity from the from the contributor. So I guess we should also ping him uh, if it's interested in continuing with the proposal or not. All right. Are you sure the board yeah. is really on the outdoor side? Why do you think it's not, Jakob? I don't know. I don't think in some extent you should let the people authoring the proposal to kind of just guess what might or might not be good enough. And I think with the Kate's work on the other proposal and so on, is this really something what you want to push or? So if it's blocked on the, on the other proposal from Kate, or it should somehow conflict, then I guess yeah, it's not on his side. Well, they are kind of related, but anyway, we have Kate asking a question and we have got no answer. I guess even Jakub asked other questions as far as I can see. So at least 
yeah, having the feeling that uh, the, the user is so is aware that there is a relationship with what Kate is doing and so he's just waiting for the Kate work so that we know but we don't have news since uh, May 14th, right? or May 7th from the user yeah, May 7th So I will ping him at least one more time. And then I guess that if in two weeks we don't get anything, we can even just, yeah close warning the user that you're going to close this because it's related to what Kate and we can come back to it when the work from Kate will be done. Something like this, or it's too aggressive? <laughs> no, I mean, more asking if uh, he had the time to take a look at uh, Kate and Jakob's questions. And of course, if he's still interested in working on this. Yeah, by the way, I guess that's fine already. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, so it seems that the time ran out for, for the meeting, so we will leave the issue triage for the next call. Uh, is there anything someone would like to raise at the end? It seems not. So thanks everyone for joining for the discussions and yeah, see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Lukas. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank um, you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.